Welcome to Crime Most French, a weekly podcast taking you through intriguing cases carried out on French soil. Research and narrated by Cedric and rudely interrupted by me, Melanie. We're the true crime podcast on the lines. Crack open le vin and let the mayhem commence. For our 10th episode, we're going to look at a less historical case. It takes place in 1907 on the 6th of February. That's and still more than 100 years ago, I have to say. It's yes. still kind of semi-historical. It's historical. It's not historical as in it doesn't appear in history books. Yeah. It's like news of the time, but nobody remembers it now. Okay. The story is that of Jean Théodore Manger, who's an insurance company employee, and he disappears on the 6th of February when he's running errands for his employer in Longo, which is southeast of Bordeaux. We are going to look at what happened to him. On the 6th of February 1907, Jean Théodore Manger, who is married, with children, is the deputy director of the insurance company called La Générale, arrives in Langon by train from La Réole, which is closer to Bordeaux. Okay, so he's got quite a respectable job. He's deputy director of a branch of insurance company, so yes, he has a pretty good job. He comes to Langon to collect at the tobacco store 1,500 francs. Now, this is what's always amazed me when I first moved here. I had no idea that tobacco was grown in Europe. I'm from Scotland, so it's cold, and I'm from the, a cold bit of Scotland, so that's kind of like cold cubed and quite literally cubed. So basically we grow nothing even ex- as exotic as that. So when yeah. we moved to France and we moved to a village, um, we discovered that, lo and behold, it was an area where tobacco was grown. Yes, in the south of France there was quite a lot of tobacco grown at some point because it was fairly profitable. Mm-hmm. It's now a lot less profitable so nobody does it. But no. yeah, for, for a while it was profitable and in the village there were two tobacco farms and we were renting a big tent for social events that used to be the drying tent for tobacco. Mm, yeah, that's right. So yeah, it used to be grown around here. Mm-hmm. So he's going to collect 1,500 francs on behalf of Madame Bouy. That's quite a lot of money. Yes, in today's term, it would be maybe fifteen, twenty thousand euros. That's a lot of money to have sloshing around in your pocket. Yeah, yeah, but at the time it was cash or nothing. You didn't True. have the choice. No bank transfers, no, no checks, no nothing. It was no. just cash. So, if you wanted to move money around, it had to be cash. Hmm. So no choice. After that, he's supposed to go to Verdelay, which is another village, by bicycle to investigate an insurance claim. So he's doing his insurance job at that point. Okay. So he takes the bike on the train with him and then uses the bike for the smaller part of the journey. Well, he yes, he arrives with the bike on the train and he has to use the bike to go around because the train doesn't go in no, all villages. So that. Verdelay, I didn't check, but it's probably an even smaller mm. town somewhere around mm. where he arrives. So Because mm-hmm. he's only planning a quick trip, so mm. by bicycle he can't go very far. So he arrives in Longon at 2 p.m., he goes to the Café de la Gare. There's always a café in the train station or near the train station. Uh, there's always a café by. Because, by yeah, you have time to kill, so yeah. you go and have a drink and wait. Then, leaving his bicycle at the café, he goes to collect the 1,500 francs across town. Mm-hmm. He tells people that he expects to be back by, by, by about 3 p.m. Okay. But he's never heard of by his family again. Ah. He totally disappears after 2 p.m. So the police is contacted by the family. They consider all possible explanations. They consider suicide, voluntary disappearance, accidents, mm. aggression. Suicide and voluntary disappearance are quickly yeah. ruled out because he has a pretty good life. A good job, good, yeah. uh, happy home And have happy family. And mm. when they talk to people he knows, none of them says, oh, something was wrong. So they decide, no, that's not likely. They also have a look at all the accidents, but... Nothing is reported on that day. So oh, the old checking the uh, the hospitals to see if yeah. there's been anyone brought in the, the in a coma. Just in case, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, But no, there was nothing. So that really leaves only one. Mm-hmm. Either he was attacked in the street and something happened to him, or, or he was just murdered. Run- or, or he's done a runner. No, because the voluntary disappearance has been ruled out. Has been ruled out. Yes, that's right. Yes, because so, of his family. Yes. Yeah, he has a good, has a good job. Mm-hmm. He was there for uh, two small jobs. 
Yeah. Good family. So def- definitely misadventure rather than um, suicide or absconding. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. what the police thinks at the time. So his family hires a train company agent to investigate in Nongong. So that's like Le Pinkerton, was it? Yeah, from what I understand, it's like a train company employee who moonlights as a PI. Oh, he's got a hustle, side hustle. I guess so. Mm-hmm. So he goes to Longong, Verdele, and all the surrounding villages to have a look, but doesn't really report anything to the family. Then two police agents from Bordeaux, also acting on behalf of the family, not as police agents, okay. also start looking around. And they find a witness that saw Manger at the cafe at about 2 p.m. and again saw him at about 3.15 p.m. in a street that goes down along the cemetery near the train station. So he's arrived in Bordeaux and he's gone to the first port of call and he's picked up all the ready. Yes. He has the money. Presumably, we don't know. Mm -hmm. because nobody took to him after he went to collect the money. So we don't know if he collected it. But surely the person who gave him the money could verify that... Presumably, yes. I haven't seen if that person had been interrogated or not. Mm -hmm. It wasn't reported in the press. They weren't trying to pull a fast one and burying him in the... uh, I I would assume the police has checked that, because that's Mm -hmm. a bit obvious. Yes. But (laughs) the press didn't really talk about that that aspect of things. They went directly from her. Yes, I mean, by the sounds of it, he had the money and, and left. Back to the cafe, according to this witness. Yeah, because according to the witness, if he was seen at 3.15 yeah, in town, it means that he has... Mm-hmm. Well, he was seen at 3.15 close to the cafe, and that's the time he was supposed to be back from yeah. collecting the money. So presumably he has the money. Yeah. So presumably he was on his way to pick up his bike. Yes, to, to, go, to go to the, to the next the job. Other yes. Area, the mm. other appraising, the yes. whatever it was he was mm-hmm. going to look at. Yes. Okay. Again, nothing is found. Mm-hmm. But the police contacted again, opens an inquiry for worrying disappearance. Okay. Part of the reason why the press opened an investigation is probably because the press starting to make a lot of noise around that story. Right. I found over 400 articles in local and national press about wow. this case. Just for one person who's disappeared. Wow. Yeah, and it's not even an exciting disappearance. There's really nothing to think no. that anything of importance um, no. happened or anybody of importance was involved. It's just some random guy who yeah. disappeared. Well, I guess the only thing that makes this vaguely unusual is the fact that they had a large amount of money with them. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But even then, disappearances are very common in the early 20th century and the police investigations are rubbish. So. Yeah, and as you say, people didn't have bank transfers, so there would have been other agents well, or totally. other other people in other um, occupations would have been have access to... Yeah. to Moving large, large amounts of yeah, money. Yeah, all about, the shops yeah. would have been moving cash around all the time. Yeah. Remember in the Bondabuno episode, they attacked a guy who was coming to the bank from a factory, I think. Yeah. yeah. In the street in front of the bank. Mm-hmm. All he had is a bodyguard. Mm-hmm. And that was it. And a mountain of cash. <laughs> yeah. It was more than 1500. I can't remember how much it was, but it was yeah. quite a lot of money. So, so no, it was fairly yeah. common. So, there's no reason to think there's anything exceptional, but for some reason, the press the decided press got, to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, okay. And it was first the local press, and then when the national press saw these articles, they mm. picked them up and started talking about that story as well. And a lot of the articles were on front pages or linked from the front page, mm, okay. which means that people actually read those articles. It wasn't yeah. like page 45 or something. Mm, yeah. It was it right in the front of the like newspapers. It wasn't like a little footnote. It was yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so it started making a bit of noise nationally. Mm. Some people have linked it to the Red Inn case. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah. Um, that was episode three for us. Yeah. Possibly mainly because it's some random person with some known to have some money that disappeared without a trace. And yeah. it also takes place in the cafe slash inn slash yeah. bar slash Hospitality hotel. Hospitality and someone yes. away on business, I in, guess. Exactly. And a very loose and, yeah, similarity. The, yeah, and the yeah. Red Inn only took place like 20, 30 years earlier. So it wasn't like a lifetime earlier, people no, do remember, still remembered it, yeah. the story in the newspapers. So, mm. so because of that, the police is starting to feel a bit of pressure. Mm. So that's why they take on the case. At the time, not only there were lots of articles, but they even published postcards that were showing the location of things and mm. the people involved. And that was all real time, so you could get your stories from the postcards. Uh, mm. There will be some on the website. Oh, wow, that's insane. Uh, we we have um, quite a large collection of um, family postcards dating back probably from not 
around about the same time, to be honest yes. with you. Mm-hmm. And some of them are just so bizarre, particularly one that has um, new farming equipment. Um, oh, um, yeah, there's a John Deere site, a uh, postcard. Yeah. Uh, it's, just, it's just utterly bizarre. Yeah, postcards were a way of moving but, uh, information could, uh, around. Yeah, that's very true. And, you know, it's just so bizarre. How there was no TV, no radio, no, no nothing. So no. you had newspapers and postcards. Well, that's when, I mean, postal, the, you would have had your post delivered to you more than once a day. Oh, two or three times a day, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Even in small villages, yes. Yeah. There would at least be a morning and evening distribution. And in no. Paris, there were three. Because Le Monde, for example, as a newspaper, was distributed three times a day. Yeah, yeah. There used to be three editions per day of that newspaper, yeah. which takes several days to read. I mean, telephones would have been new, but oh, nobody would have had phones yeah. in 1907. Yeah, I mean, but certainly, I mean, people in Paris, business and businesses in Paris may have had phones, possibly, but but not. Oh, even then, it, remember on the Titanic, they had telegraph, and it was all brand new and exciting, and it was 1912. Mm. So in the middle of the countryside in France, 1907, oh, no, no, no. nobody would no, have no, seen no. a phone, no. so they wouldn't know what it looks like. So, yeah, that was the only way to get information mm-hmm. around. Because of that, and the context of the time, which was that there were a whole bunch of gangs acting in various parts of the country, and because the police was useless, they acted in complete impunity. So, for example, we had the chauffeur de la Drôme in the previous yeah. episode, mm-hmm. then we had the Bonne mm-hmm. again, but they also had the Apaches in Paris, which was a, a gang in the northeast of Paris. There was also the Northern Gang. There was a whole bunch of gangs and they were involved in assassinations, burglaries, kidnappings, and nobody was doing anything because the police wasn't really getting anything done. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so when you take the noise in the national newspapers and the fact that people were starting to feel unsafe, yeah. two judges, two local judges, decided to take on the case. Mm-hmm. So it was Judge Castel, who was a prosecuting judge. Okay and Judge Pradin, who was an investigating judge, so it's equivalent to a DA in the US, so he handles the case with the police. Okay. Whereas the prosecuting judge prosecutes at the trial. Uh-huh. But they both get, get involved, and because they get involved, they force the police to get involved, and then things start happening mm-hmm. a bit. At the time, the police starts investigating by asking people what they think about the cafe, what they think about okay. the village, and this sort of stuff. stuff. Remember, in the Gilles de Ré case, the church has an investigation based yes. on rumors, uh-huh. but that's pretty much what the police was doing first. So they go around the place and ask questions yeah, about people, course. places, mm-hmm. whatever. Do you have any stories about the cafe? Yes. Do you know the owners and what are they like? Yes, this, mm. that's what they, they start yeah. doing. Also, it's a good starting point given that's the last place that he was known to go. Well, yeah, that's always the first place you start, is the last place exactly. that you've seen. Yeah. He disappeared from there or mm. after mm-hmm. having been there. So, okay, let's start asking questions about that yeah. place. The owners of the cafe are called Eugène and Lucia Brancherie. Mm-hmm. So at first, the investigation goes absolutely nowhere. Oh. They don't find any clue, any good witness, any even suspicion that anything happened at the cafe. But at the end of February, one of Lucia Brancherie's friends, who's called Madame Laurentine, is alerted by the newspapers she reads, and she hears that the manger disappearance might have happened in the cafe. She contacts the police because a little while earlier, Lucia, who was one of her friends, came to her house one evening and she had a lot of money with her when before that she couldn't pay her debt. I've just got an image of her fanning herself with all this money going, oh, yeah. good Lord, isn't it hot in here? So she's done the, the rookie mistake. Of flashing Spl- the money. Splashing the cash. But mm. that's what it sounds like, yes. Yeah. And that's what the woman thought. She thought it was very mm, weird. Yeah. That she went from being in debt and really not being yep. able to pay them to mm-hmm. having lots of cash in her pocket. Yeah. So looking into it, the police discovers that in Nangon, from the 7th of February, Eugène Brancherie, the owner of the cafe, not only pays his debt, but also has unusual festivities. So he has parties and goes to the restaurants. Mm-hmm. And he also flashes the money. So they both make the rookie so mistake. Big, yeah, big, big flashing red lights yeah. now going off. But at that point, Manger is still not found. No. The, they searched the cafe, nothing. nothing. Okay. There is, however, a presumption and a series of testimonials that link Eugène Brancherie and Joseph Gassol, the local guy, to a gang in Nongo. Okay. On the 1st of March, the instructing judge has Brancherie and Gassol arrested, okay. possibly for a burglary, but it's really 
hearsay, but that will do for now. Okay, so they are tucked away. Yes, so they are arrested yeah. and questioned. So it's it's essentially just her that's out then. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Soon after, they arrest a third person called Fernand Parot, okay. who was an employee of the cafe. Now the police feels like they have the gang, that like these three people were supposed to be the mm. gang. They deny all implication in the disappearance, and the judge has absolutely no proof still. Mm -hmm. But that changes when a woman who was an ex-employee comes forward. Uh -huh. That woman is called Henriette Courage. She's a next dishwasher at the cafe okay. and occasional prostitute at the cafe. So it's <laughs> not the best of the cafes. Not a high-end Parisian cafe. No. No. She's also Joseph Gasson's mistress, one of the okay. three arrested. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. He apparently told her that Eugène Brancherie and Fernand Parot knocked out Manger and threw away his body in the river, uh -huh. the Garonne. Gasson also admitted to her that he was involved helping them. Uh -huh. He doesn't say he killed him. And he doesn't say he was involved in the murder. He says he was he involved in helping them. He disposed of the body. Yeah. Mm. Henriette is the star of that story. <laughs> she totally enjoys it. She gets interviewed and photographed by the press every time she goes to the trial. She's followed around town by crowds. She gives interviews left and so right and So basically she turns into um, a reality TV star. Yes, she, yeah. that's exactly what mm -hmm. she was. She she was a big thing at the time yeah. just because she came forward with that story. Yep, she would either have her own series on E or she'd be heading into the jungle to be I'm a celebrity, depending on where your location is. Delete is applicable if you don't know either reference. Yes, and in 1908, she even takes part in a stage show in Bordeaux where she plays herself. Good Lord, she milks it good. She, oh, yeah. she travels around with a three-legged stool and milks it for all it's worth. That she, she got mileage out of that 15 minutes, so definitely. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, there will be photos on the website mm -hmm. of her that were, they were taken by the press. Of course. She left her job at the cafe mid-January 1907 mm -hmm. because she moved to Bordeaux. She stayed with uh, Madame Larieux, who is St. Catherine, right in the centre of Bordeaux. Nice. And she continues to see her lover, Gasol. Mm-hmm. After she moves, oh, okay. and it's during one of those visits yeah, mid-February mm -hmm. that he tells her that story. Yeah. In turn, Henriette tells the story to her landlord, Madame Larieux, mm -hmm. who, when the affair starts getting traction in the press, alerts the police in Bordeaux because what she heard seems to be linked to that case, and maybe the police should know about it. Yeah, good lord. So. So the, it, it was the landlord that went to the Yes, it wasn't her. It yet. wasn't her. So she was a big star, but she didn't really do yeah, anything. Yeah, she didn't earn it, did she? No, no. No, no, she's not even that honest. No. When the police wants to arrest her, they discover that she left Bordeaux. Okay. So they look for her and they find her in Angoulême. Oh, roads lead to Angoulême. Eh? <laughs> yeah. So they bring her back to Longo and they arrest her. Mm -hmm. Because they think that she might be involved. Okay. At first, she refuses to talk, but then she changes her mind. And she promises to talk if Lucia Brancherie is arrested. So she's obviously scared of her. She doesn't want her out. Well, I guess if you're going to uh, murder someone, then yeah, you have to be pretty hardy and probably worth being scared of. Yeah, I guess so. The police doesn't need to be told twice. They arrest Lucia straight away. Thank you very much. We'll take that. Yep. Mm -hmm. And our head starts talking. Okay. She says that Manger came back at the cafe at about half three in the afternoon. Okay, so he did make it back then. He apparently made it back. He came back for his bicycle, mm -hmm. as he had said, and he was getting ready to go to go to Verdelay. He has a coffee, mm -hmm. but he talks a bit too much. Loose lick, lips sink ships. Yep. He is lured away by Lucia Brancherie. Um, I can guess how. Mm-hmm. She gets him out at the back of the cafe where... I thought he was a good family man. I, I, well, I, I have to question his morals at this point. There's nothing in the press about that, but <laughs> yes, there's suspicions. So there he's ambushed. Okay, that serves him right. Because Lucia had heard him talk about the money he came back from in his collection. Yeah. So she thought that maybe she could have some of that. Where's the money, Manger? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Manger is first hit on the head with a hammer by Parot, but doesn't die. So e Brancherie takes the hammer, does the same thing again. Oh, good lord. At that point, he loses cons consciousness. Oh, you would do it. So you? the two men lower him into the basement. Okay. 
and there they finish him by strangulating him with a rag that they rolled. Wow, that's savage. That oh yeah, that savage. would have taken a while. Once he's dead, they request Gasol's help, and under the cover of night, uh-huh. the three men take the body and throw him in the garden in the river. Ah, uh, okay. So fast moving, probably never going to find him anyway. But that's what they were hoping, yeah. yeah. So that's the story she tells the police. Okay. But at that point, it's only one story from what witness. They need a bit more. Mm, so they continue yeah, searching. So. Mm-hmm. And they find another witness called Jean Lacampagne. Jean Lacampagne is deaf and mute, but he works at the cafe. His life is a misery at the cafe because of the owners. They're just I, I would have they're thought, nasty. I would have thought his life was hard enough as it is to have a horrible job on top of that. Poor soul. Yes. Yeah, mm. yeah, totally. And there would have been no social security, no, no benefits, or nothing. No. So he would have been on his own. That's why he was working. And lots of social stigma at that point, yeah, presumably, yeah. yeah. But he didn't have a good time at the cafe, but he Let's. took whatever it could take. He says that on the night of the murder, he got to the cafe at about 4 p.m. Mm. to start his shift. Okay. And when he arrived, he found the front door closed, which was a bit unusual. Yeah, for four o'clock, you would have thought that would have been almost the start of the commuter commuter time for people going through the station, and there would have been a lot of food traffic. So yeah, kind of bizarre. So he knows how to get into the cafe anyway, so he goes round the back, Mm -hmm. and he goes through the basement. And there he sees Borchi and Paro covered in blood. Uh Uh-oh. He sees Lucia carrying a basin of water, trying to wash her husband's jacket. Oh, isn't that just typical? The woman has to do the cleaning. Yeah. (laughs) And there's blood stain stains everywhere. No wonder he, they hit him with a hammer on the head. Oh, well, yeah. That's, so that uh, would leave some, mm, that would some be blood. That would be a lot of uh, splatter marks and splashbacks as well. Yeah. When he's spotted by Eugène Branchy, the owner of the cafe, he's hit first oh, and then guy. threatened that if he doesn't keep quiet, the same thing would mm. happen to him. Yeah. So... I bet he kept quiet. Uh, yes, even if he could talk. Yeah. Later that evening, he goes back to the basement and behind a curtain, he finds Manger's body and at that point, oh, he's that terrified and just runs away. Yeah, that seals the deal. I'm off. I don't want to be next. So at 1 a.m. on the 7th of February, so we're talking the next morning very early, yep. under the full moon, he is sleeping in the barn facing the cafe uh-huh. because that's probably all he could afford, sleeping in the barn. And he sees all three coming out of the basement with a heavy package. Okay. And they take that package to the river through Lover's Lane. Okay. You can't make that up. Also, Lover's Lane follows the cemetery. But oh, that's a bit grim. <laughs> and they specified that it was under full moon so that he yes. could explain that he could see what was oh, going yeah, on. Yeah. When so you, I'll tell you, when you live in the countryside, um, when there's a full moon... Oh, it's daylight. It, it almost does feel like... I mean, I can look out the window and practically see everything in the garden. It's yeah. quite shocking. I mean, when, when we first moved from, from a city to, to here, it was just... I couldn't get to sleep because it was just too dark. Too dark and too quiet, Too remember. dark and too quiet, that's right. And, uh, yeah, the full moon just completely... Yeah, so it doesn't surprise me that he saw them um, without any streetlights because there wouldn't have been streetlights then, presumably. Oh, no, no. no there'd be no well, on gas, possibly. No, no, not in villages. No, no, that's true, yeah, we're not, but no, I, no. I suddenly had in my head... Even it here, streetlights only appeared um, recently. Well, where we used to live, the streetlights only appeared when somebody died in the 80s and left his money to the village. Oh, yeah, that's right. Before got, that, there were no streetlights. We've street got lights. lighting and a lovely big sound effect. Yeah, and here the streetlights okay. appeared in the last 20 years as well. Yeah, wow. Well. So, as, no, there would have been no streetlights whatsoever no. at that point. But full moon, so... Full moon, you're all right if yeah. you're doing things by full moon. So there is a confrontation between Henriette and Gasol. Remember, all three plus her were arrested. Yeah. And that brings Gasol close to confession, but not quite, but mm-hmm. very close. He admits that he help, helped transporting the body, yeah. and he was paid 250 francs for it. Well, that would make him an accomplice, surely. After the fact, yes. Yeah. yeah. Facing Gasol's admission, Paro decides to confess his role in, uh, uh-huh. in the murder. He says that Manger's murder was planned by the Brancherie couple as soon as he came back in the afternoon and as soon as Lucien made sure that he did have the amount of money he said he did. Paro also admits that he hit first and then Brancherie finished the murder. Mm-hmm. And the body they threw in the river wasn't weighed down, so they say they saw it float away. Mm. That's it, that's the last time they saw it. Well, you're so close to the estuary and then that's it, you're, you're out into the Atlantic at that yeah. point, mm-hmm. so yeah, it could be anywhere. Could be anywhere, yeah. So having confessed, Paro is confronted to the last dude, mm-hmm. to Brancherie. Yeah. 
So now we have one witness, two kind of confessions. Yep. So we just need the last one. The police at the time, they loved confessions. If you didn't have a confession, they didn't want to trial okay, someone. Yeah. But if, you, if they had confessions, they were happy to go to trial. So they want the last confession yeah. and then that, that's it. Yep. They're ready to go. The last so, piece in place. Yeah, Bonchoy is still denying any involvement. Okay. But faced with the two confessions, he decides that he had no choice. Oh, so, so he falls like a cheap dent. Yeah, he also confesses to the murder. Lucia, his wife, never stops denying. She never confesses anything. She's a hard woman. She probably was a hard woman. And you can maybe understand why oh, yeah, didn't want her out if she talked. Oh, yeah. Because, yes, she's the only one of all of them who never confessed to anything. She's the one with the biggest ball. Yes. So after that, the police would like to find something mm -hmm. more than just confessions. So they start searching for the body. So they didn't have to, but they really wanted to be sure. So they really to find, wanted to find that body. They start on the 9th of March. The main person involved is a diver called Dubagnet. He, for six months, dives pretty much every day all along the river to try to find anything. They want to find the bicycle, maybe, because it disappeared yeah, yeah. with him. The body. That doesn't float so well, does it? Yeah. So he looks for anything. That's six months of hard work because that's a fairly fast-flowing river. Yeah. There's no visibility. And the, the equipment, they must And we're talking old-style old yeah, so diving. So the big brass head thing. Exactly. Yeah, wow. Brass helmet, leather, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pipes, yeah, for somebody yeah. pumping at the other Oof. end. So, yeah, yeah. Cousteau hadn't uh, invented the aqua lung at that no, point. Not yet. So no. no. So that would have been the hard six oh, months. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dives all along the river, and as he does, more and more people watch him. Of course. It's on entertainment, first, is it? Yeah, on the first day. There was probably a postcard. Oh, they, they are, <laughs> there are postcards, yes. They're on the website. Yeah. No, I'm saying postcards of the diver. Luke. Yeah, yeah. They oh, are oh, on the oh really? Okay, <laughs> yes. okay, right, okay. On the first day, um, the press reports 200 people watching. On the second, they report 4,000. Wow. That's so big word of friends. mouth. That is big oh, yeah, word yeah. of mouth. They also searched the banks of the river for a burial site, yeah. just in case they lied and they didn't throw the body in the river. Maybe they buried the guy. So yeah. they also dig around the, the mm -hmm. banks. I just, it, I just instantly have in my head of people watching this as like live streaming. As, yeah. as, as, as mm -hmm. a society, we've not moved on at all. No. If there's simply. anything salacious, people mm -hmm. will watch it. Yeah, but they don't find anything. Okay. Um, on the 30th of March, they fish out a body. Mm -hmm. at, at first, they think it's that, but when uh, the coroner looks a bit, too, a bit more closely, the teeth and the clothes don't match. So it's dismissed it's not, as nothing. It's him. just some poor soul. Yeah, they don't know who that is, but okay. it's not him. It's not him. After the confessions, the police goes back to the gang mm -hmm. and they ask them, okay, now you've confessed, you're going to go to jail. Maybe tell us exactly what you did with the body. Okay. Paro and Gasol explain precisely where they dumped the body and the bicycle. So the police goes back, mm -hmm. dives again. On the 3rd of April, the whole court goes to Longo. Oh, for a look. So all the judges, yeah, they uh -huh. go and have a look. They go straight to where uh, Gasol and Paro said they dumped everything. Okay. The diver dives at about 10.45 a.m. and he finds the wheels and the luggage. Right, okay. Uh, in, in that spot. Yep. X mark the spot. Yeah. So they now have the bicycle and his luggage, but not the body. Bloat and float. There's yep. just no way they're going to find that guy. I'd be very surprised if they find the guy. On the 19th of August. Okay, here we go. The diver finds the hammer. Ooh. Remember, he started okay. on the 1st of March. Yeah, yeah. We're now 19th of August. They're still searching. Wow. They that really guy, to find that, that guy must have big lungs yep. and be very fit. The corpse is eventually found. Really? I'm yes, very surprised. By a boat driver called Clovis, Clovis Combe. Clovis. Clovis. Mm -hmm. Near Bacalanque in Bordeaux. So okay. it's the key in, in the center of okay, Bordeaux. Yeah, uh -huh. It's very, very decomposed. But his wife and his son, his son's called Jean Arthur, they recognize the clothes okay. and they testify that they, yes, that is, that is his body. Well, that's good that he can be laid to rest. Yes. Mm -hmm. The Amy slash coroner confirms that the skull has been crushed, probably mm, with, yeah, a hammer, with a hammer. Yeah, with a hammer, With a lot of force, obviously. Mm. And also that he's been strangled. So that matches the story the police has been told. M Manger is buried on the 3rd of November 1907 mm -hmm. in Blagnac in the family grave. Okay, that's... That's nice, but sad, but, you know, at least it could be put to rest, you know, yeah. near the family. Yeah. So the inquiry completed on the 25th of November, the judges released seven ordinance. Okay. 
they essentially arrest formally everybody in, involved in the case. For hedge rule. Uh, well, let's see. Brancherie par Gasol are transferred to the fort of A, H A. Ah. In Bordeaux, still exists. Well, a tower still exists. Okay. That's still where the tribunal is. And then the trial starts. So the trial is scheduled to run from the 27th to the 29th of November, 1908. 27th to the 29th? Of February, sorry. 27th. So that's only three 27th days. 27th to 29th of February, 1908. So not long. It's three days. But it's, it just doesn't feel long enough for no. to decide the fates of four people. Yeah. The two branchery and Paro and Gasol are accused of mur murdering Monchi. Mm -hmm. One additional accusation is added, entolage, which I had to look up. It is the theft of a client, or robbery of a client, okay. by a prostitute or her, or her pimp. That's very specific. That's what entolage is. Yeah, so you... you so that's added to the charges. So you are right then. He was, he was, mm -hmm. he was being lured back by... Mm -hmm. Also, a certain Monsieur Bois, who shepherd in Bezas, mentions that he has seen Henriette at the cafe mm -hmm. as his client, and she also robbed him of 200 francs. So, so there's precedent there. So that's precedent. And Henriette is therefore arrested and is co-accused in the trial. Okay. Starting to go not so well not for so her well at for that her. point. Mm. There are about 125 witnesses called, and the declaration of Henriette and accompanying the confessions, the body, and everything they found makes really no doubt on the issue of the trial. We know what's going to happen. Yeah. But still, Lucia denies everything. <laughs> she still denies she has any part in this. She's a hard woman. Oh, yeah. Eugène Brancherie, maybe in search of notoriety, turns the trial into a farce. Of course. So he, he, a bit like Landru, episode four, five. Calls on the judges, on his wife, on new witnesses. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It turns the whole thing into a circus. For example, at some point he questions Henriette and he asks, um, has asked her about um, her activities with her clients in minute details, which the audience in the in the court found very funny. Yeah. Several times the president of the, president of the tribunal threatens to suspend the proceedings because it's just turning into chaos. Seems very strange that uh, as as somebody who's you know there to be judged. They generally have to keep quiet and, and not say anything. And yeah, but he knows he's going to go to jail forever, if not the guillotine. Yeah. So really, as far as he's concerned, he has nothing to lose. Okay. So he's just going to make hay. Ma uh, yeah, bring chaos to the court yeah. and have fun, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, no, he's not supposed to, to talk or do anything, no. but he does it anyway. Mm -hmm. He asks questions to people. Despite all that, the issue of the trial is not really a surprise. On the 29th of February... Eugène Brancherie and Paro are sentenced to death. Okay. Lucia Brancherie and Gasol are sentenced to life or hard labor mm -hmm. with a minimum of 15 years. And Henriette is acquitted because they couldn't prove the, the robberies. Okay. On the 27th of March, a month later, they, their appeal is rejected. Mm -hmm. On the 7th of April, Brancherie and Paro request president, presidential pardon. Okay. On the 20th of July, the president, Fallier, Remember episode one on the chauffeur de la Drôme? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He pardons them. Yeah. Like he did from the, for the chauffeur de la Drôme, but for one of them, number four. Out of oh, yeah, that's right. The, the first three were guillotined, but the fourth one was pardoned. Was that, that was the one that was tried in absentia, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. But because he was tried later, it was a different president, and he decided to pardon him. Yeah. Uh, histor historians later said that that probably... It was a bad move delayed the mm. end of the death penalty in France by about 70 years wow. because there was a bill in Parliament at the time. Mm. Well, this case added to it. <laughs> as soon as he pardoned them, the, the two that were um, sentenced to death, there was an uproar in the country again. And it's nearly the same year. I think mm. the other one was 1907. This one is 1908, okay. the trial. So it's really at the same yeah. time. The consequence is, again, that the bill in the Parliament is removed so there's several cases Th mm, that, that president had a good intention i guess because he didn't like people being killed yeah. but because of what he did a lot more were mm, yeah on the 4th of august lucia is transferred to the central prison in montelier in a tuberculosis wing mm. and i couldn't find out if she did have tuberculosis or mm. if she just was a prisoner in that wing okay uh, on the 6th of august brancheli and paro are transferred from bordeaux to the, the prison in saint martha -Dre on the island and there they take the boat, guess two. Oh, Papillon? 
Yeah, Guyana, because they're they've been pardoned by the president. So then it was hard labor uh, for you. You don't for think life. really have they been pardoned? Yeah, <laughs> did they really win anything uh, out no. of that? I don't know. Well, they won a chance of a lovely suntan. I guess so. <laughs> And 100% humidity. Oh, no. Gasol is transferred to Périgueux, where he's tried for another affair. That confused me for a little while, until I found out what it was. The tribunal there adds 20 years of banishment. Wow. After the 15 after. years of hard labor has been okay. sentenced to. He's then transferred to La Rochelle, and then... Guyana. Uh, yeah. He dies on the 2nd of October, 1909. So He, he didn't last long. He lasted, what, six months? Yeah. No, a year. A he year. lasted a mm. year. On the 13th of June, 1910, Faro escaped from Guyana, wow. from the prison. From the prison mm -hmm. But it was quickly recaptured anyway. Okay, yeah, yeah. And he's sentenced to two, two years of solitary confinement. That would have been fun. In that heat on your own. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, in, in a box, yeah. Yeah, I'd be wanting to take my head off myself at that point. Yeah. At the prison in Guyana, Brancherie is the baker. Okay. That's what that's his role, mm -hmm. and he dies on the thirty first of August, nineteen thirteen. So, so he, he made it what four years. years. Mm -hmm. yeah. In August nineteen twenty six, the president Gaston Dumergue, so later on, mm -hmm. reduces Lucia's sentence to fifteen years of hard labor instead of life. Oh, okay, so she would have served it by that point. She would have been close to having served it. Yes. Yes. Because it was, was 25 and they went, was it? And it's 26 and they were sentenced uh, in 1908. 1908. So oh, 1909. Would, yeah, so, 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 yeah, she would she essentially would have served be gone. It, yeah, yeah. It was basically let yeah. her go now. Yeah. So that's the end of the case. Okay. And on the side note, the story of Brancherie and Faro in Guyana appears in the book called Vision du Bain. It means visions from the prison. Mm. It's a book that collects very short stories on people that were sent in that to that prison mm -hmm. and the relevant pages are also on the, on the website okay if you want to read them oh, I, I take it they're in been translated into english no they're in french no, they're in french there's an old book there's no translation <laughs> okay i didn't take time to translate <laughs> two or four pages no okay it's not that interesting fair yeah. enough fair enough it just tells a story with the story of them arriving mm -hmm. in the prison. well i think for me the biggest takeaway and the biggest moral no matter how heavy the prices are in the buffet car when you're on the train, sometimes it's safer to have a wee drink on the train and not in the station. <laughs>